Well, welcome everybody to another One Million Cups. Anyone here for the first time? Oh my God, that's a huge amount. Well, welcome. Let, uh, let me give you a, a quick rundown of how One Million Cups works. We have one hour broken into two half hour segments. We have two startups to talk about how awesome they are. They get six minutes to present, followed by 20 minutes of questions from you. We'll uh, be running around with microphones to pick up those questions, so uh, be thinking, be ready for them. Uh, one million cups, just a couple housekeeping the rules. Uh, we are lucky enough to have this great space from Kaufman. Kaufman takes great care of us in uh, prov providing us this area every week. You have paper cups, make sure they make it to the trash when you're done. Uh, I guess that's one housekeeping rule. I can't remember what the other one is. It's probably not that important. Uh, one million cups is uh, Kaufman, we have George Brooks here. Wave, George. Nate Olson. Uh, John McGovern is running late this morning. Myself, I'm Mike Craig. We try to organize and keep this thing going every week. That's enough about that. Let's get our first presenter up here. Who has pets? Woo! Everybody loves their pets. Pets are like a $55 billion industry. I just read about that this morning. So our first presenter is once a piece of that $55 billion pet industry. So please welcome to the stage Nick and Amy and two assistants to tell us about Slickhound. Can everybody hear me? Sound good? Good deal. Good morning. Welcome to One Million Cups been coming for a while. I'm glad to finally be up in front of you guys. Um, my name is Nick Luke. This is my wife, Amy. This is half of our pack. The little one here is Dasher. He's a Whippet. The other one is Daxon. He's a Slukey. Um, but our startup is Slickhound. And uh, as Mike had said, uh, the dog business is big business. It's a very big business. We're very excited to participate in this industry. Um, basically what Slickhound is, is a fine uh, pet products manufacturer here in Kansas City. We make all of our own stuff. Um, we're at the top of the food chain. Um, that's where we'd like to stay. Um, I did have some cards. Those are kind of important. Okay, Slickhound was founded uh, by us uh, because we have a passion for dogs. We have four dogs. Um, anybody who has a dog, um, a lot of you know what it's like to really have that special dog, the one that sleeps in your bed, the one that gives you those eyes when he hasn't been fed, uh, the one that you know, makes mess of your carpet and then you can hardly yell at him because he feels so bad. Um, we, we've had a few of those. Some of our dogs are excellent, others, they're kind of a pain. Um, but basically, there's 78 million dogs in this country. Uh, a third of every American household has an average of two dogs. It's a lot of dogs. Um, within that industry, there's a growing trend of pet parents. Uh, we would be pet parents. They're uh, younger people or single people, um, and they can also be married people, but people who treat their dogs like their kids. They want to have the more expensive pet food. They want to have the more expensive products. Um, a lot of this segment uh, goes to small uh, pet stores like Brookside Barkery um, or uh, Doggy Style Boutique in Westport, places like that. They do the grooming there. In those small stores, they do have retail, okay? And in those small stores, a lot of the better ones, you're gonna find very unique products, very unique products, where you've never seen those types of products before, and some of the brands, and other, other stores will just have some of the main brands in the industry. What we hope to do is we hope to provide pet products of all types, not just dog collars, um, to these small businesses to help them compete against PetMart um, and, and Petco. Uh, Petco and PetSmart uh, take up 50% of the entire industry. They're responsible for 50% of the revenue. There's 17,000 small pet stores in this country, 17,000. And anymore, uh, the markup and the margin on the best par pet products are so low that these small pet stores can hardly even survive in the retail industry any longer. Uh, most of them have gone on to grooming and more of the service side, which is very stable and is also a growing industry. But those small businesses are the only ones that can provide that kind of service. You know, when you go to a PetSmart or a Petco, um, you're not going to get the one-on-one -on -one attention you will with a small shop. Um, so we're going to make products, and we are making products, specifically for those stores to sell. 
Um, our first product line is EcoBoom, okay? Um, we couldn't do every product to start with. We want to do every product, but obviously we just can't do every one to begin with. Um, so we've started uh, with a hemp dog collar, okay? Um, there are hemp dog collars out there. We're not the first one, um, but we do have more variety in this line of uh, hemp collars than any other company on the planet. Uh, some of the highlights of the, of the EcoBoom line are they're available in three quarter inch, one inch, one and a half inch, and two inch. This is a two inch. So you can see how thick and wide that is. There are no hemp collars currently sold over one inch, you know, which is interesting because there are lots of dog collars that are of the wider variety. Um, so we're kind of coming in with a newer type of product. Um, some of the highlights of the EcoBoom line is uh, the yellow thread right there, that's Kevlar thread. Uh, you're familiar with Kevlar because it's used in bulletproof vests. It's also the strongest thread in the world. It takes heavy machines to sew with, it takes different techniques. We're the only company to do that. Um, the EcoBoom line features uh, a piece of webbing, hemp webbing, which is imported from Romania, okay? And then it features hemp fabric over the top that's sewn over the top. That's military spec thread over the top. And then the Kevlar thread is the yellow thread that we use at all the stress points, okay? Um, not only do we have a lot of colors, we have 12 colors. Um, we can make the collars in slip lead, double loop martingale, and side release. That's a side release. This is a slip lead right here, uh, which will pull. But uh, basically, Slick Hound is looking to provide more variety in very familiar segments. So dog collars is our first stop. And you know, there's 250 breeds plus out there, all different sizes. There's dogs that weigh five pounds. There's dogs that weigh you know, 200 pounds. So you need a lot of variety in these higher margin environments uh, to appeal to the customer. You know, and that's what we hope to do. Um, so a little bit about EcoBoom. Uh, why hemp? Um, hemp is, a, is a, just a marvelous natural fiber. Um, many of you have probably heard of hemp because um, it's illegal. <laughs> um, there is some specifics to hemp. Uh, the stuff that you smoke that's illegal in most places other than Colorado and Washington um, is completely different than commercial hemp. Commercial hemp's been used for thousands of years. Uh, they make rope out of it. It's its primary use, but you can make any type of fabric out of it. It's a, it's a wonderful natural fiber. It's the longest natural fiber on the planet. The longer the fiber, the stronger the end product that you make with it. So it's much stronger than cotton, so on and so forth. So for a dog collar, a hemp dog collar is really strong. It's a very important thing about dog collars. You want you know to have a strong dog collar. Some of you might have dogs that pull you down the street and you don't want to have to worry about that. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting, go back one on that. The other thing that's really interesting about hemp is it's resistant to mold and bacteria, okay? Many of you who have pets probably have nylon collars. They're very simple. You buy them everywhere. They're very plain, um, you know, standard colors and whatnot. They're, they're great collars. They'll last a long time, okay? That's, that's going to be the staple of the industry for a long time. But what happens is over several years or several months, depending on your application, the dog collar really starts to smell. So much so that you oftentimes have to throw it away. What that is, is mold and bacteria growing within the weave of the webbing. Hemp is resistant to that. Hemp is so resistant to that, in fact, that hemp has been found to kill staph on contact, which is incredible, which is incredible. So this is a great collar that can be worn inside, outside, um, how we make them, okay? We wanted to be a production uh, company because uh, we want to be able to make the collars and sell them, okay, to the small stores. Uh, we sew them. We actually dye the fabrics. We just started dyeing our own fabrics, so we have it to where we know how to make the stuff. Um, the future of Slick Hound is very bright. We're very excited about being here today and about what the next four months is all about. I'm an e-scholar student at UMKC, so if any of you are familiar with that program, I see one of my professors right over there, Mr. Boozer. Um, it, is, it is an accelerator for student ventures, and it takes a lot to get selected for the program, and being selected for the program means that you got a glimmer of hope. You know, it's something that can be done. Um, so over the next few months, uh, we hope to commercialize this product even further. Uh, we're already in two stores. Uh, we'd like to expand that to 10 or 15 stores by the end of the summer. Uh, we do have a website online at slickhound.com. We are able to sell online now. We don't have any marketing going into the website yet, but as we get a little more money this summer, um, 
we're going to start driving business to the site and start uh, really establishing ourselves um, as a retailer. Um, and then throughout the summer, we're hoping to develop more products. Uh, one of the keys to Slickhound is not being a one-trick pony. Uh, we do not want to just do dog collars. There's lots of companies that do dog collars. In order to separate from us from them, we have to make other stuff, dog toys, other types of dog collars, leashes, uh, treats, you know, maybe someday dog food. Dog food is very, very big business. It makes all other dog business look kind of small. But um, anyway, that's Slick Hound, so I'll open it up for questions. All right. So people who know me know I rescue dogs, and so I'm wondering if you have any plans to work with animal rescue organizations in the area, or um, around the country even. Thank you. Um, we definitely have plans to work um, uh, with rescue organizations. There's obviously a, a huge need uh, for adoptions and so on and so forth. We see it on TV every day. We're not at a place we can do that yet, but we get calls every week about people who want you know, free stuff to auction off and things, and, and we want to be a voice uh, for those needs in the future. Right now, we just can't, but it is something that we hope to do. Uh, we also hope to uh, bring out some lines of products that help raise money for um, human concerns. Um, both my mother-in-law and my grandmother uh, passed away from ALS in the last three years. Um, so as a manufacturer, we have a lot of power to do things like we could sell collars on our site for 50% uh, benefiting those charities. And we could do a special line of collars that's specific just to those charities. And those are things we hope to develop to get along with our, our retail goals. Right now, um, being that we're the manufacturer, we have a lot of limitations placed on us. Limitations of revenue, of inventory, of how quickly we can make them. We can't just make a call and get you know, $500. It's not just money, it's, it's time and money, being the manufacturer. So, um, These two are not rescued. Our two rescues are at home. Uh, we have an Afghan hound um, who we rescued. Uh, we, we adopted from a breeder who was no longer needing her, I guess. And then uh, we just recently adopted an Italian greyhound, um, but from a family. So anyway. Nick, question back here from your left. OK. Hi. If you have a sales channel for the internet and for retail, are they going to cannibalize each other? And how do you get the retail people to buy into your good concept with the internet? That's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we've been at this for a couple years, actually, uh, trying different methods. Um, real small footprint, seeing what works, so on and so forth. Um, that is a concern. Um, our primary goal as a manufacturer is to keep distribution with us. I mean, that's going to kind of be the strategy going forward. Um, as that, we can actually control pricing a little bit, make sure it doesn't get into the volume, online sellers. And when we put something online, uh, we're not going to undercut what the retail price is. Obviously, we could, um, but we won't. Um, and that's the best we can do right now because we have to build our own rep. It's a beautiful day in Westport, which is a hemp shop, head shop. They sell all kinds of hemp-related things. Our collars are there. Um, and then we're in uh, Pet World of Lawrence, uh, which is one of the largest uh, privately owned pet stores in, in, in Kansas. Um, we're real excited about being there. They've only had our collars for about five weeks. And new products in the dog industry are not like cell phones or other you know, more of the tech stuff where there's lines out the door when you release these things. It's something that you just have to slowly get into the stores with, and then as we get more products, uh, we can, you know, have more shelf space, and then you'll see Slick Hound all over the place, and it'll be a lot easier to get sales. Nick, question right back here. I think of hemp as itchy, uh, and, but I was fascinated by your statement that hemp kills staff on contact. Yes. I know it would be a departure. You mentioned caring for humans as well, could you make pillowcases for hospitals or blankets or something that would, I mean, that's a huge issue there, staph infections. Right. Um, the uses of hemp are just unlimited, virtually without limit. It's, it's, it's superior to so many products that we use every day. Paper's one of the top things. Uh, of course, cotton is too. Cotton uses a lot of, uh, of hemp, and they use it in a lot of their products and they have for about 20 or 30 years. And they oftentimes buy out the supply of 12 ounce hemp entirely. You order bigger amounts more often. But um, you know, moving forward with uh, the changes in legislation in Colorado and Washington, we hope that commercial hemp growing returns to this country sometime in the next five or 10 years. Because um, that would be great. It would really drop our prices down a lot. 
Got another question for you back here by the columns. Key to the small pet shop uh, market is point of purchase displays. Have you thought about how you're going to combine your product with the right point of purchase display to really um, convey your message? Right. Thank you for that. Um, yes, point of sale is extremely important. Extremely important. Um, I've been fortunate to work for several uh, successful sales uh, enterprises, Honda, uh, Skag Lawn Mowers, um, you know, some big brands that really do a good job of, of getting their name out there. Um, in the pet products industry, there aren't a lot of brands that uh, focus on, on point of sale. I'm not sure exactly why that is. Uh, it might be a distribution thing. I'm not sure. For us, um, the product in Slickhound is about being perfect from top to bottom. I mean, obviously, perfection is hard to attain but it's what we're going to try. Our hang tags that we put on the collars, I only have one today, it's on that back table, um, they're hand stamped in heat and boss, so they're raised, we have fluorescent, uh, uh, the EcoBoom color is a fluorescent orange um, on all of our stuff. We hope to employ uh, nice shelf toppers, um, eventually get into corner displays and stuff to, to really get prominent deals, but when you, when you start talking about POS uh, for Slickhound, uh, we feel the most effective way to do it is to offer enough products where you can stack them up next to each other and then just the sheer quantity and volume of different products really it's really a, a great message. Um, a lot like still chainsaws. I don't know if you've ever been into a hardware store and seen still chainsaws but they have kind of a franchise deal worked out with their stores. Not everybody can carry still and when you decide to carry still you have to you know um, service them and, and you're going to make big money because we, we hope to advertise our brand unlike any other dog products manufacturer does. And the reason that we can do that is by not working through the standard distribution model and distributing ourselves, um, the, the margins are higher. We can afford to advertise. We could, we could someday possibly do TV commercials and stuff and really drive the traffic to the small stores. And that's going to be a selling, a selling point for the small stores because they're not advertising. They can't advertise. They can't advertise in the sense that you know, Nike or Coca-Cola or any of those companies can do. And there's nobody in the pet products industry that's doing that. There's just not. And a lot of that is because the margins are so low. I mean, that's a, it's a major problem. If you sell something in a small store and you mark it up, you know, 40 or 50 percent over what you pay for it uh, to make your profit, because you're not selling a large volume, it's a problem if the customer can go in and see that exact same product online for 5 percent over markup. And, and that's the reality of almost every major dog products brand out there. I mean, you got Lupine, you know, Kong, Planet Dog, all of those places. You go on Amazon, you can find any one of those for much below what a small store would sell them for. That's what Slickhound is hoping to change. When you go there, you're going to find the same prices online as you find in the stores. Any question back here from the tables? Hey, real quick, just to kind of touch on what you were talking about with the POS and how mm -hmm. you guys are marketing your products in the store and with your other marketing. Um, I just read a research study, it was done by ICMI Research that basically they surveyed a bunch of people and found that 85% of consumers will actually spend more for good service. How are you guys promoting your products to the, to the, you know, the boutique stores that you guys are working with so that they're able to offer your products you know, in a, in a service-oriented way? Right. Give them a little more value. Right. Um, that's one of the really exciting things about working with the smaller stores. Um, being a smaller store, a lot of them are already service-based, um, so they already have the ability to provide that service. We hope with the POS, uh, we hope to provide education, um, you know, extra marketing. So, like when you buy something from Slickhound, you get a bag that says Slickhound and it's behind the counter, and they put it in a really nice bag. And when you walk into the store, you know, official Slickhound retailer right on the door. And hopefully it gets to a point where if these businesses are making the most money selling our stuff, which they will if, if we have it our way, then they're going to want to sell it because that's how they make their money. Right now they're not making money in retail. It's a problem. Why would you have a retail space and not make money? It's, it's crazy. And that's why a lot of them have gone so heavy into the service side of things. So the businesses aren't going anywhere, but the retail is. And the retail is going to go to Slickhound. So. Question in the back here. Hey, good morning. I I uh, saw your products up at the very front. I thought they were pretty nice looking. Thank um, you. When I th but then you started talking about hemp, and I hope this question isn't offensive. But when I think about hemp, I think about hipsters and Occupy Wall Street. And uh, neither of those really appeal to me. Do you have any plans? Um, we're always going to call it hemp because we pay a lot of money to have it be called hemp, unfortunately. Um, but you're right. It's not going to appeal to everyone. Um, you know, the dog products market is so varied and vast that there really is something for everybody. You know, everybody wants something different. 
Um, that's why the variety within the lines, the different colors, the different sizes, the different actions, um, is really going to help us. But uh, yes, we are definitely going to get out of hemp and do other things as well. I mean, we're going to stay in hemp, but um, hemp will stay very much part of just the EcoBoom line. That's the name of the line, and that's just one line. Obviously, right now, since we only have one line, it looks like that's all what we're doing. But uh, when you start getting into you know, the synthetic materials, the nylons and stuff, uh, they're a lot cheaper. You know, it, it's, it's going to be nice to compete with price on some of the other manufacturers, because with the hemp, we really can't. Uh, since our largest hemp collar is two inches in width, and the next biggest hemp collar anywhere on the market is one inch, that means that our two inch collars use twice as much materials as our competitors. Thus, obviously, they're going to cost more. It Very naughty little wine female who chews the collar off of my male. So I can't actually keep a collar on the animal because she just chews it off every time. So I'm very excited, and that is appealing to me. Even if you do the boutiques, um, even if you do the smaller stores, I still am wondering how you would keep up. Um, just having been a presenter here before, I know that there's a big boom of interest and um, of what happens to the business the, the couple weeks after you present here. And so I'm wondering what your plan is to keep up with that because it kind of sounds, I mean, do you have, do you have one person making the collars and you're making them by hand on one sewing machine? Um, and so I'm just wondering what your plan is to kind of meet the need because it would be a shame and something that we kind of have learned from the, the greatness of this forum is that you have to be ready, you know, to kind of not say no to, to people when they want your product. So I'm just wondering what your, maybe what your six month plan is to meet that demand because I would hate for you to get on that ship that's sailing and not be able to continue because you can't meet that need. Right, thank you for that. Um... Yeah, that's definitely a concern. Anytime you try to do manufacturing, there's a lot of constraints. There's a lot of issues. I've already told you that hemp's kind of hard to come by. Um, it's always kind of a challenge to get enough of it uh, when you need it and as quickly as you need it. Um, but I, I'm not really sure how much business is going to increase um, on the boutique side of it from a presentation like this. I mean, it'd be great. Definitely go tell all your dog store owners to buy from us. Um, but uh, you know, right now, over the next three to six months, as I'm in the eScholars program, you know, I need to let uh, the program take its course. Um, they've got a system in place to really um, get us to where we want to go. So right now, we're really lightly doing the stores. We're just trying to kind of build our first relationships and contacts and, and such and see exactly what they want, you know, how they want it done, so on and so forth. But as far as like our online sales and, and, and all of you buying a collar today, you know, when you get out of here, <laughs> um, we're ready to go. You know, we've got um, ten or fifteen thousand dollars worth of unfinished inventory, raw materials. I mean, that's not how much the raw materials cost, but when they're all finished, that's where we're at. So we're we're ready to go for this presentation. And we do only have one machine, and my wife runs the machines, and I I do a lot of the cutting and the dyeing and the ironing, which there's lots of steps. Um, but we're, we have space for three machines. Um, one machine um, in the right hands can generate about $4,500 to $5,000 a month at 40 hours a week with this product line. Uh, so the product line with the margins, especially when you start thinking about doing it one-on-one -on -one sales, because the collar only costs us about $5 to make, and we sell them for $28 online. And that's, that's right in the market. I mean, we're not really that much more expensive than anybody else. When a store um, sells them, obviously, we're not getting that much money. Um, but it all works. It all makes sense. It's why EcoBoom is our first line. It's important that uh, not only can we make it, it's important that we can make money doing it, you know. Um, but that is, that is definitely a concern. Right now our website doesn't have any, uh, any um, Google marketing done to it or anything like that. We're not driving traffic. We're not openly advertising to stores and such just because of that. You know, if, if a company called me and wanted 600 collars by the end of the week, yes, I'd have to tell them no. Hopefully we don't get that call for All right, a All right, Nick, your, your dogs are telling me your time is up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick, Amy Luke, and their two beautiful assistants. And we'll be here for a little while.
Any, anybody know any good jokes? Nobody? Hey guys, sorry we're getting set up. Um, I'm hijacking the commercial break. Um, my name's Nate Olson. I'm the chief caffeinator. It's a working title of this program. Um, and I'm really excited. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we did our six month survey of our audience. Um, about 26 questions, but the two most important questions to me is who's coming to this event and why are you coming? So I thought I would share the data uh, for you. Um, we had uh, over 110 responses, which is statistically very high. Uh, I did that. Um, yeah, 60% of our audience is in, uh, and why we're coming. A lot of people think that One Million Cups is a, a networking event for entrepreneurs. And although we um, love that all of you connect with each other, and that's really important to us, uh, off, off, you know, plays off of the One Million Cups idea, uh, we asked you why you're coming. And um, we really want this to be an experiential learning opportunity for entrepreneurs. And so um, the highest ranked answer uh, was 78.5% of you said um, that you come to One Million Cups uh, because you get to learn about what's going on in the community. So uh, that's who are the entrepreneurs, what are they doing, what can you do as a community to support them? So that was the highest answer, so that's really cool. The second highest answer was that this is an educational opportunity. Um, it's an experiential uh, learning platform for entrepreneurs to learn from one another. And we're really excited about that. So I just wanted to share the, the two most important data points for me, and uh, we'll be publishing that data and how that changes over time. Um, also, I wanted to show off our website. Um, I feel like my job is uh, to empower entrepreneurs all across the country, and I have to build the tools that allow them to do that. So I want to show off our awesome new website. Um, we have a counter for cups. Um, we're averaging right now about 550 entrepreneurs a week with this program. Oh, no. Come back. Okay, so I want to show you how to use the website real quick. And as all of you know, um, with any working product, you know, we're constantly making changes. But um, as of next week, we're launching our eighth and ninth cities. We're launching Denver and Chapel Hill next week, which is very exciting for us. Um, thank you. I said we'd be at 20 cities by the end of the year, and we're on target to do that. Um, so if you go to find an event on the home page, it shows our map um, of where we're currently located. And you can go down the side, or you can click on the map, but I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to click on Kansas City. So each community has their own page. You're welcome to go into each community, but this is Kansas City's home page. Couple uh, important features. Right here we have uh, tell us you're coming. Of course, we don't require an RSVP, but um, we love it because if we have a change in venue, uh, we can send you an email. That's really just for us to, to send you an email. If you're interested in presenting and taking the stage, request to present on the Kansas City page, and we review all of our applications every Monday. So uh, we will be back with you as soon as possible. As you can see, presenting today, are the two company profiles in the middle here. So we have Slick Hound and Beer Station. A little bit about the company, if you click on their logos, it'll take you directly to the website. It also gives you their Twitter information so you can tweet at them. Um, then we have our stake can be up and running there. Maybe we crashed it, I'm not sure. It's a good data point. Uh, we have Flickr here with pictures and uh, follow us and like us on Facebook. Probably the, my favorite section of this is, is the organizers. So this, this community, uh, One Million Cups, is run by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. And in most communities that you go to, you really have no clue who the community organizers are. And it takes um, a very long time to get plugged into the community. So we've just um, made sure to build that in. So here are community leaders, uh, George, John, Melissa, and Mike. A little bit about their background, uh, their Twitter handles, and their websites. And then this is my favorite part, past presenters. At midnight tonight, our presenters today, their company profiles will drop down into this ever-growing wall of companies. If you click on the company, so we had Gift Professor last week, it pulls up their company profile, a little bit about the entrepreneur, and then their, their video. So you can watch them. 
And uh, this becomes huge because if we go to, um, let's show off another community. Let's go to Cedar Rapids. So here's Cedar Rapids community, same format. They have one uh, entrepreneur a week. It's definitely a smaller market uh, that's presenting. They're working on their way to two. Here's pictures, their Twitter, Facebook, everything, meet the organizers, and then their past presenters. So nobody's ever been able to show what startups are in these second tier cities, which is really what we're going after. Uh, we don't want to go after the top 10 uh, cities. So um, anyway, I want to show off this tool. I hope that you use it. Uh, I hope that you learn about what's going on in these other communities and uh, definitely engage on the Kansas City page. And uh, please also, I would love your feedback. Um, you guys are our customers. The entrepreneurs at the foundation here are our customers. And um, I listen to you guys every step of the way. So if you have any feedback for me and how we can improve the program or our website, just send me an email. So this is about the entrepreneurs. I will get out of the way. Um, let's introduce John. Thanks, Nate. So we're really excited to have the website up. Please go and check it out. Tweet about it. Talk about it. Go check out who's presenting next week. And then if you get time, go through and look at some of the uh, performer. I know how many hands showed that they, were the, they had been here for the first time. So definitely go back and check some of the archives of the past presentations that we've had. So somebody said this morning, um, one of the hardest things to follow up when you're doing a presentation and you have multiple presentations is to follow up kids and animals. Well, that's, that's what he gets to do. But then somebody else said, unless you're talking about beer. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so needless to say, we, we got a chance to go down and, and uh, check out the beer station uh, about a month and a half ago, maybe a month ago. And we were blown away by the community that John is creating at Beer Station. Um, oh, one side note real quick, because I may not get a chance to say it afterwards. Um, we have approximately 230 people here today. So that is a great, great job showing up. So John, don't freak out that there's 230 people. Listen to you, okay. Um, so needless to say, we got a chance to go down and check it out. And the community that John was building was something that we really thought was just a great story to tell. And then the, the road that he had to go through in order to just get this place going um, was really exciting. So I want to hand it over and give a warm welcome to John with Beer Station. It was a little early for beer, but who here does not think it's too early for beer right now? <laughs> All right. That's either totally awesome or a little bit questionable. So. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm John Couture. I'm the owner of Beer Station. Anybody been to Beer Station? I know Paul has. I see some people here. So thank you very much. Um, I'll get through this really quickly. I see my timer, so I'll, I'll go through it. Um, basically, Beer Station is the Midwest's first craft beer tasting bar bottle shop. Essentially, we're the best of both worlds for craft beer fans. Uh, we are just like a tavern. Uh, you can buy beers on tap uh, or you can buy beers to go. Uh, you can drink your bottles of beer on site or take them to go just like a packaged store. Uh, this is a pretty special kind of project that um, I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit about how, how it got going here. And we'll tell you a little bit more later. Um, how it started, that's my good friend Dan Kiefer in the middle there. Uh, in 2006, we went on a research trip to Europe uh, to investigate. Um, we really liked the European beer culture. Uh, and so we kind of went, we went to Germany and Belgium, and we, uh, what we were struck with was the European beer cafe vibe. Uh, you know, you've been to a lot of American clubs and everything, and there's this, it's a little bit more of a, it's just, there's a little bit more of a homey, warm atmosphere in a lot of the European places, as you can see in some of the pictures we took. Um, so on this night in Cologne, Germany, Boulevard representing there on my shirt, uh, we decided that if we ever found the right concept that we could bring to Kansas City uh, that could integrate this kind of European beer vibe, uh, we kind of vowed that night to bring it. So that's 2006. Flash forward to 2011. Um, I was doing research online, and I found out about this tasting bar bottle shop concept that was just going like wildfire down the coasts. Uh, started in Portland, Oregon. And uh, it was just, I, I started calling and talking to owners of these places, and they were all doing great. And they said that you know, the craft beer industry has just been going nuts. It's recession proof. Uh, it's been growing double digits for the past decade. Uh, it's, it's just a fantastic business model is what I found. So um, I went to Kaufman and uh, started to kind of say, let's try to see if we can bring this project to reality. And there I was assigned with the best business coach in the world, Jill Green right there, Jill. Come on, to kind of uh, work with Jill since she had that experience that was just completely key to trying to bring this thing forward. 
So we developed our business plan, we did uh, viability studies, and what we found was, it was illegal. Um, <laughs> we, uh, so, a little bit of a hurdle. Uh, so, uh, what, what we, <laughs> but we didn't give up. There's a few dicey moments Jill can tell you about. But, uh, so uh, I recruited the help of Polson Only Sugar. Uh, I got some uh, legal counsel to work directly with the city government. And what we found was the city was actually fantastic to work with on this. Um, yeah. This is, I just, I really want to say this is a side I want to kind of tell people about because, you know, we always hear about just government and everything. This is an example where they wanted this to happen here. Councilman Glover and Councilman Sharp uh, moved this through the city council processes and it passed unanimously. The mayor was very excited too. Uh, so, and we basically uh, got this going. It took a long time, but it was really worth it. And I see John Pager, John Pager from KC BizCare really helped us also. So, it worked. It was a lot, it was a lot of, uh, it took a little bit of time, but it was, uh, it, it, it was, but we got it going. So this is, we passed this in our, um, August 2012. We wanted to open before the end of the year. Uh, so we found a location in Gregory at 120 East Gregory in Waldo. Uh, we found this is the, this is basically like the core demographic for craft beer in that area. So we thought this is a perfect place to, uh, to set our business. Uh, we are internally financed, which is, uh, it, it's been very helpful. Uh, through family and just internally, uh, we, uh, what we found we needed to do though was we needed to educate the public on the concept since it was new to the Midwest. So we found that people are really interested in beer. Uh, before we opened, we had uh, 1,300 people who liked us already uh, before we even opened our doors. And what we did was we really engaged them and um, really wanted them to feel like they had ownership in this. So this is our bar under construction. And what we did was we requested people through Facebook to bring their donated wood to help us build our bar. So we had people pulling up in pickup trucks and you know, just dropping off wood, and they would come in and they'd say, hey, there's my picket fences on the back bar, that's so cool. Uh, and it really kind of gave people a direct connection and they got to see what was going on. And then we also worked with uh, neighbors to kind of you know, talk about this concept and make sure, tell them it wasn't gonna be a typical liquor store kind of thing. And that was really uh, key to us moving forward. So, we opened in December 2012. Um, it's going fantastic. Uh, we're, because we're first to market in the Midwest, uh, it's been a great way to kind of introduce Kansas City to this business and also uh, give us a great start. Our sales are double our initial projections. Um, the age demographic has been really interesting. When Jill and I were doing some of our initial uh, studies, we thought we were thinking 25 to 45 year old for demographics. It's a lot wider and it's really cool. It's like everybody loves beer. So uh, that's what we found so far. And um, we also, uh, the location has been absolutely key. Um, I know there's several people here I see here who are regulars. And um, what that does is it limits any downturns you might have with uh, seasonal or being dependent on big events around you. So we never have any big dips. Um, we've already expanded our food menu and our taps. I think we're looking into probably going so far. Um, and that's it. I think, did I do okay on time? That didn't, okay, I, I think that's about it. So if anybody wants any questions. I always have a question. Uh -huh. So um, I'm a volunteer with one.org and we were talking about having a place uh, where we could have a, a social justice on tap meetup maybe where people could just kind of come together and, and talk about issues and I thought, what a great place uh, to have it. Do you have space at, at your? We sure do. Okay, is that something? We have an, uh, <laughs> we have an uh, hey, hold on. We have an upstairs beer garden uh, that I think Nate can tell you, but they really, really liked a lot. In the middle picture there, we've got garage doors that open. My neighbor, another na uh, neighborhood engagement, my neighbor hand built all these Bavarian picnic tables. It's old school European feel upstairs. It seats about 40 people, and we wanted to give it that, that European vibe. So we created no TVs. We created like an upstairs space that's just, it's fantastic, so. So, yep, you got it. My, there's my contact information. A question over here on your left. Those of you that know me know I got a thing for local products. How much uh, do you have any local products in your store? How many local beers have you got? And um, what kind of community do you have supporting the new craft group or groups? We'd love to have more. Um, St. Louis is uh, really uh, has a little bit of an edge on the, the local brewers that. Um, they're, they've got a lot of upstart breweries, and I really like. We're, we're really trying to encourage local brewers to get established. Unfortunately, it's not up to us; it's up to them to get licensing. 
Um, but I've already talked and spread the word. If people can get their stuff together, um, we, we are all about featuring local taps. Uh, we've tried to spread the word among the grassroots beer community here. Uh, it's just up to people to get their licensing together to get these upstart breweries. So we're really hoping that develops in the near future. Question right here from Cameron. Hey, Cameron. Hey, uh, I'm curious to know more about your legal struggles. Uh, what, was, what was the justification about? My nervous breakdown. There you go. About um, why it was illegal, how you found out about that, and then what was the rule change that made it legal? It, particularly to know, like, is this just a, are you like an exception to the rule, or is this legal now? Nobody else can do Citywide. This. Okay, right. perfect. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Um, there's, this, there's an ordinance called the 8020 ordinance, and it was a city ordinance, so it was legally statewide. Uh, but what it was is it was designed because there, in certain areas, uh, there are people who are taking advantage of the community by opening up a liquor store and getting people totally tanked and selling them packaged beer to go. Not the best thing. Um, so that's what the intent was originally to, uh, it, it limited the amount of packaged beer a tavern could sell to go. Uh, so it was really reduced it to a point where we weren't going to be able to operate by doing that. So it was a very good intent, but the way that uh, Glover and the council worked with it, they, uh, they helped maintain that, the essence of that ordinance to protect communities, and you have to get community buy-in uh, before you can open something like this. Uh, but it's a new kind of license they built that it's called a sales by the drink combination license. So it kind of combines the two different uh, entities, two different kinds of businesses in one. But you have to go through a, 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 some channels. You can't just open them up like that. You've got to make sure the neighborhood's okay with you opening up. Does that make sense? So. John, back here in the back, on in your right in the middle. Hi, um, I live in Waldo and my husband actually brews beer on his own so I can definitely verify your market research. Um, but having gone to the store, I wanted to make a comment about how the interior is very, um, it seemed to me kind of sterile and there the fluorescent lights and the hard surfaces. So I just wanted to know what your, well, in comparison to when you think of a um, sort of bar comfortable, maybe, you know, upholstery, a little bit more, um, I don't know, um, that kind of atmosphere. I just mm -hmm. wanted you to talk maybe about those design decisions. Some of them are budget, you know, so the lighting and everything. We definitely know that the lighting isn't the best in the world. Uh, and I know that we, we've got plans down the road to kind of soften that up. And the furniture, I definitely can, I'm sure, can be you know, improved upon. Uh, we have lots of people. I think it's another thing that we have lots of people that really like the kind of vibe we have with the kind of with the wood and the, with the tile and everything like that, too. So, um, you know, we're trying to balance that the best we can. So. Uh, but definitely, I, th I know the lighting. Lighting is something we're working on for sure still. That's in the works. Question in the back here by the tables. Yes, I was a little curious about your demographics. Um, okay. I'm not quite sure I want to know exactly how you got the age, the age information of your customers. We'll leave that out for a minute. But uh, are you able to capture any information about just what percentage of your business is coming from the local market as opposed to either... Um, the rest of Kansas City or the beer tourists as you call them and how you might use that going forward for possible expansion? We've basically, just getting started, we've just tried to make everything run smoothly. We haven't got a chance to really drill down into the details, but we, you know, we know our customers and we know that it's more of that down the road. We get, we get a pretty good idea where people are coming from. We can kind of see the crowd as they come in, so we know a lot of the people that come in too. Another question from the tables. I love your concept, so I could sit here and drill you with questions for hours, but I'm going to try and keep it simple. Um, one, I, I really have been experienced to the, the concept that you have. We had one in uh, Tennessee where I just moved back from uh, called the Lajero Lounge, which was kind of a beer garden type place, and then also had a cigar lounge as well, which was really kind of cool. Um, but do you have plans for future expansion and franchise uh, possibilities? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know. I'm not. It's too early right now. I just want to make sure we get everything running smoothly. But that's one of the things we're, you know, we're wondering about down there. I'm not ruling it out, but I'm just trying to make sure this place gets going. We fix the lighting. Yeah. Things, things like that, maybe. And and then a special request. Um, no one in Kansas City can manage to get it here, but uh, Bristol Brewing in Colorado Springs has an incredible beer called Laughing Lab, which would go great with the other guys' dog collars. So maybe you could bring that in. <laughs> I recommend calling them and asking if they can just say, that's basically, I tell people that ask them why they're not here. And they, a lot of times there's, there's many different reasons why they're not in markets. So just I might, might just want to give them a call. 
All right, I'm going to sneak in a question for myself. Um, when we went on our One Million Cups reconnaissance trip, I, I think we were struck by the, the uniqueness of your beers on tap. How do you get some of those crazy, weird beers that you don't see anywhere else in the city? You know, we have really good reputations, or, uh, really good relationships with our distributors, and um, we've got a very knowledgeable uh, GM that uh, we work with. We look for the things, a lot of the things we look for are the beers that aren't quite as well known, but we know people would like. A lot of the a lot of places just go with the big trendy seasonal beers, and we try to look for the things that we think that people would like, and we try to encourage people to, that that are available, but people just don't buy them. So, and we rotate our taps continually. We don't keep putting on the same beer. It, we're constantly cleaning the lines, and so you never know what's going to be on tap. Even if you come in a day later, it could be totally different. Over here in the front, how many beers do you offer? How many type? How many brands? Pack, packaged or. Um, it rotates all the hundreds. Um, we don't have an exact count. We've got on, you know, we've got a big bank, and then we have uh, 21 taps right now. Um, we thought about keeping the taps down from like the monster taps you might find around because we like to be able to rotate and keep it fresh, so we don't have stale beer sitting there. We do. We're not. We are. We're beer enthusiasts. We're not beer snobs. Seriously, people on Bud Light, that's cool. We will not judge. So, <laughs> guaranteed. If, if people do, come talk to me. If people tell you that, we don't want you people treating people like that, so. Yeah, yeah. Another question back at the tables. Hey there. Is there anything you could do to put uh, the beers that you have? I'm over here. Sorry, <laughs> you couldn't find them. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the beers that you have and kind of market them online so that people can, so that you can tap in to kind of the social interest piece that I mean it's a cool experience if you could somehow bring that online and advertise here's what we have on tap this week I don't know maybe you do already but we have a real-time tap list online wait okay cool where is it at is it just on your website it's on our website uh, and we're also we re we're redoing our website too so it's also uh, there's a there's a local person who's doing really cool work uh, it's called draftster and they're basically it's a place where you can go find out what's on tap they're trying to work with local pubs and everything to try to have a real-time tap list of everybody um, so we're, it's pretty much updated. Sometimes we get a little busy and we don't get a chance to get it totally on the time. But. And, and this may sound a bit buzzwordy, but is there any way that you can kind of gamify that in the sense of basically kind of bringing the, the beer tour online and kind of get other people, you know, friends and everybody seeing what kind of beers they like and starting to kind of identify these people who yeah. like this also like that. My background is actually video production. I was a producer, and I really want to uh, bring in new kinds of media to this, like having customer beer reviews and things like that down the road when we get established. We're building in more of that uh, so we can have a little bit more interaction that way into our new website. So, yes. Question, question back here at your near right. Sorry, Nate, you can't cut. Beer Station, you spelled it funny. How'd you come up with the name? Oh, crap, did we misspell it? I'm just kidding. It's, that's, a German, <laughs> that's, the, that's the German spelling. Uh, we were in, since, we, since, we, uh, um, since we kind of hatched the idea in Germany, and it's, your, it's not a German place, but it's, that's a German spelling of beer, so we thought we kind of want to give a little bit of a European vibe. Okay. Um, so I was in for a beer yesterday, and uh, we were talking about the presentation, and um, I, <laughs> I love how you... Um, do this crowdsourcing social model. So like people said they wanted games, so you bought a ton of games, you know, so people could sit there, you know, in the, uh, the long tables and play games with one another. It's really fun. Um, and so now you're asking people, you know, what kind of beers do you want to see? So, how, you know, like as you ask the community to engage, they're also investing, and so that becomes, you know, uh, better, better uh, for your business. So can you talk more about your strategy for sort of crowdsourcing choices for your business and, mm -hmm. and really listening to your customers versus just guessing what they want? Well, before I opened this place, I was just kind of a local beer dude. And, you know, like everybody else, like, you know, I, I just looked for ways that I love all of the local places, and I, I'm, I definitely don't want to talk down about it, but I noticed that a lot of people just push out information through social media. I'd be like, hey, this is on tap, come get it. Hey, this is on tap, come get it. We wanted to kind of flip that around a little bit, and so we wanted to kind of invite people to kind of tell us what they wanted. So we've got a, we've done something where people can uh, vote for ingredients to put in a special cask that a brewer from Tallgrass Brewing out of Manhattan would put in there and bring right to our bar. Uh, we really try, we've, yeah, we, we engage people all the time. Right now we're letting people pick out board games they want to have, and we're going to have board game nights with all different kinds of categories. Uh, we're looking, we're asking people and actively getting their involvement. It's a continual thing. 
I, it's the things that I always wish that people would ask instead of just assuming they know what people want. From beer, you know, what kinds of beers to just what kind of vibe do you want? What do you want it to be? So we want to keep moving that forward. Next question in the back. Hi. Um, hey. I was curious about, you mentioned how large your demographic was and that you had traveling people. I was curious how you appeal from the marketing aspect to all of those people and how you, how you get people to do that, to come and visit you. Social media, it's such an engage, I'm sure social media doesn't do everything for everybody, but because it's such an engaged audience, we're really lucky in that, you know, through Twitter, through Facebook, uh, we're just getting into Instagram, uh, we just, we basically just say, hey, here's what's going on, and we let, we get people, input from people, and we just, you know, we'll, we'll tweet about events, and people are all connected. So it just, it basically spreads that way. It's social media and just, and just word of mouth, too, has been what we've been doing. It's been hugely successful for us. Question right here for you. Yes. Um, it seems like there are some resources out um, in the world for startups that a lot of us might not be um, familiar with. The last guy mentioned eScholars. You said that you uh, worked with Kaufman. Can you talk a little bit about how you came about that and that experience and um, how that might benefit some other people? Yeah, I mean, it's just, I would just recommend talking to as many people as you can and um, the one thing, I, yeah, the downtown council recommended Kaufman to me, so that was, and then I, I went there and met with Jill. Uh, but the other thing I'd really recommend is if you're a startup, one of the biggest things, and this is going to be kind of hard at first, but I would really recommend top, finding someone else in another market who does something somewhat similar to you. It doesn't mean exactly. And I did not have one person turn me down. I talked to people for the phone for hours. Um, and you can learn so much good information that you never could expect through just doing research by yourself even before you even find a connection like UEP with Kaufman. Uh, and I, that was invaluable. So that's one thing I would really recommend. And then just trying to find out what kinds of resources are out there and if it's a good fit for you. For someone who's not a big beer fan, how do you target them? Um, I'm being drug along to drink beer with friends from time to time, and I find that I'm pretty picky. I've only liked one brand so far. Oh, we got something for you. We have people all the time. <laughs> we have people, who bring, we, have, uh, we do serve wine too, by the way, for wine. So, but we do, we have people that come in and, uh, you know, they say they're not a big beer person, and you, you know, you may not be, but most of the time we're able to find a good fit for you. There's so many different kinds of beer styles and flavors that, 99% of the time we can find something you like. It's just a matter of talking to you. And we, that's why we have that very personal connection with people. We're like, what do you absolutely not like? Um, and so we, we're, you know, if you're a wine fan, if you're a spirits fan, we usually can find something that's a good fit for you. John. Uh, Come see me. I'll, I'll work with you. Final question of the day. Um, and I know I asked you this yesterday, but what can we do as a community to support? You have the eyes and ears of 230 people. Um, what can we do? I mean, I think I, I would love input about now that we're, we're off to a good start. I think that I would just, I'm, even though I'm not thinking about expanding or anything anytime in the near future, it would be good to talk and just kind of get a, an idea about when that's a good idea and when it's not. I know we talked about that a little bit. Um, so that would be if anybody has any input about that experience in the area with going from like maybe one location to another one uh, or franchising or anything, just to kind of have that information there. And the other thing is we, Traditionally, these businesses are open like 4 to 11, 4 to close. Um, you know, we've tried to kind of establish a little bit of a lunch crowd, but it's always going to be mainly a nighttime business. But I think it'd be interesting to hear from people that if, if there is a way where we could build more of that kind of daytime crowd, um, that's something I think we'd be interested in because it just it hasn't been done too much. But just like this thing, I'm sure there's a way to do it. But so those two things I think would be very, I think that's something that'd be really felt very helpful. Great job. Let's go ahead and give them a round of applause. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so, and, and by another round of applause, do you guys enjoy One Million Cups? Yeah? Okay, so make sure you tell everybody, same time, same place next week, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks.